Well, hey there, everyone. It's about that time again. One more lecture video. This is the last one talking about circulatory system. Uh, the last thing that we really need to talk about is um, the vessels that actually conduct the blood. <coughs> Excuse me. We've already talked about the blood itself and some of the characteristics of that. We've talked about uh, the heart and how it's structured and how it works to move the blood um, through the body. And now we're going to be talking about the actual blood vessels that move uh, move the blood. So uh, let's go ahead and get started up talking about that. Excuse me, sir. Can you direct me to the naval base in Alameda? It's where they keep the blood vessels. Blood. Wessels. Excuse us. Oh, excuse me. Uh, we are looking. Blood. Can you tell me where the naval base is in Alameda? We are, we are looking for nuke. Hello. We are looking for the blood vessels in Alameda. Could you tell me where? Can you, you help us? Please. We're looking for the naval base in Alameda. Could you tell me where the nuke blood vessels are? Nuke. Ooh, I don't know if I know the answer to that. I think it's across the bay in Alameda. That's what I said, Alameda. Alameda. I know that. But where is Alameda? All right, so we've got blood vessels and circulations going on. So the vessels are, there's three kinds. We've got arteries. Arteries carry blood away from the heart. Now this is what, this is how you need to think about it in the direction of the blood flow. So arteries carry blood away from the heart. Commonly, people think of it as carrying oxygenated blood, but as we're going to see, that's not always the case. Um, and actually, we discussed it in the heart anatomy video. So. Arteries carry blood away from the heart. Veins carry blood to the heart. Usually it's deoxygenated, but not always. And then capillaries are small vessels where exchange takes place. O2 for carbon dioxide, nutrients for wastes, and stuff like that. And this is uh, a cross-sectional view under a microscope of the different vessels. Now, I want you to look at some of the structural differences between the arteries and the veins here, okay? Um, for example, the walls of the arteries are a lot thicker than the veins, um, and which we're gonna talk about here in just a second. So, structure of veins and arteries. All veins and arteries have the same three layers. Um, we have the inner layer, it's the tunica intima. Then the tunica media is the middle layer, and that's where the smooth muscle takes place. All those times we talked about vasodilation and vasoconstriction, that smooth muscle is what's doing that. And then the tuna externa, the tunica externa is the outermost layer. Um, so looking at arteries, arteries, tra blood travels away from the heart, except for, uh, it's usually oxygenated, and except for the case of the pulmonary circuit where deoxygenated blood is going to the lungs. There are three types of, arter of arteries, elastic arteries, muscular arteries, and arterioles. And here's a diagram showing some of the structural differences between those three. And we're gonna get into greater detail about each one. So the first one are the elastic arteries. These carry the very large volumes of blood away from the heart. Um, the walls are, have a lot of elastic fibers in the tunica media, and if you look um, at these little lines right in here, like this, those are these elastic fibers um, that give the artery walls their resiliency and lead to the, the elastic artery's name. They help, uh, kind of like shock absorbers basically, they dampen uh, pressure fluctuations. So the ones that we talked about in the cardiac physiology, there's really big changes especially with those blood leaving the heart. Um, and you don't want to waste that energy with the arteries ballooning out. These are all your major arteries, the aorta, the pulmonary trunk, which is the main uh, artery that branches off into the pulmonary arteries, the common carotid, which is the artery that feeds the, uh, the head, subclavian, common iliac um, arteries are all uh, other major arteries. The second class are the muscular arteries. These are medium-sized arteries. These are the ones that are gonna branch off of the elastic arteries to distribute blood to the skeletal muscles and the organs. They're characterized by a thick tunica media. 
compared to some of the other ones. Examples are the brachial arteries. Those are the ones that uh, provide blood to the lungs. Mesenteric arteries provide blood to the uh, uh, abdominal organs, external carotid, femoral arteries. Those are the ones in your legs. Um, Superficial muscular arteries, so superficial, remember that's close to the surface, are important pressure points. Um, so there's pressure points in your uh, feet, for example, in your arms. Um, those are important pressure points for therapy. And here's a diagram showing the uh, structural differences, and we can see right here the thicker tunica externa. Um, now it does, if you notice, it does have some elastic fibers, but not as many as the elastic fibers. And then the final one is the arterioles. These are the smallest arteries. They're characterized by a poorly defined tunica externa. Uh, different changes will, um, different responses will change the diameter of these blood vessels. So like uh, uh, environmental changes, uh, endocrine changes, like hormonal changes. Um, if you have to dilate the blood vessels, um, that sort of thing. And you can kind of see the tunica externa right here is very, very thin. So looking at an actual microscope image of these, it's very difficult to discern that sometimes. All right, so uh, in sort of going from the heart, we've gone elastic arteries to muscular arteries to arterioles. Now we get to capillaries. These are very, very tiny blood vessels with one cell layer thick walls. Um, these are the smallest blood vessels. The diameter is very close to the size of a single red blood cell. Now we've talked about you know, how in some cases the diameter of the capillaries is actually smaller than the red blood cell. This is where diffusion between the blood and the interstitial fluids takes place. There's three types of capillaries, continuous, fenestrated, and sinistroid. Uh, and these are so the top one, those are diagrams of the capillaries that we're gonna talk about. And then we've got examples of microscope slides as well. So let's talk about the first one, the continuous capillaries. Continuous capillaries are uh, characterized by a complete endothelial lining. So endothelium is the um, innermost layer of the um, of the capillary. And so the endothelium is complete. There aren't any holes in it. And that'll make a little bit more sense when we talk about some of the other ones. Most of the regions of the body are supplied by continuous capillaries, um, except for epithelial tissues and cartilage. And if you look at it, um, the tunica intima for capillaries is known as the endothelial layer. And it's continuous. So it's an unbroken um, tissue layer. And if you notice, like this little purple thing right here, that's the nucleus. And so this layer is only one cell thick to allow that diffusion to take place across the membrane. Here's another one right here that you can see. Now these little bubbles right here, is the, a process known as pinocytosis is taking place. Now, pinocytosis is the bulk movement of water across a cell by the formation of these little budding vesicles right here. So they're kind of like little, I don't know, like water bubbles, I guess you could talk about, talk about it. Um, that's how we bring bulk movement of water. Fenestrated capillaries. Fenestrated capillaries contain windows. Uh, that's what the fenestrated, they're windowed. So we've got these pores basically that allow for the very rapid exchange of water and solutes. And actually this kind of gets into one of my favorite words, uh, which is defenestrated. Defenestration is the process of throwing somebody through a window. So um, there's a little bit of vocabulary trivia for you related to that. So fenestrated capillaries, um, places where you have to have rapid exchange of materials, uh, choroid plexus in the, in the brain, sort of the formation of the blood brain barrier, blood vessels in the endocrine or organs where we have to get a lot of like hormones out and so on and so, so forth, and the absorptive surfaces in the intestines 
and in the kidneys where you have to have a lot of bulk movement. And you can see at the diagram below um, the fenestrations, the windows, so they look like little pores all over the place. And then the third one is, well, that one's coming up here. Let's look at the picture. So here's a, a zoomed in picture of that. These are those fenestrations right here and right here, those little windows. And that's just gonna allow stuff to pass through a lot more quickly. What's kind of cool about these pictures, if you take a look, here's our capillary. And just as a point of reference, here's our red blood cell right there. It looks like a freaking monster. Um, our third one are sinusoid capillaries. They're like fenestrated capillaries, but they're more flattened, in, uh, but the openings are flattened and irregularly shaped. The endothelium is incomplete, allowing a free exchange of water and solutes. Uh, the liver, where you have a tremendous, a, like a just really, really big amount of um, bulk movement. Uh, same thing with the bone marrow, so you can get um, blood cells into the bloodstream, spleen, so you can get blood cells out of the bloodstream. Um, and as you can see right here, it's very, very patchwork, um, very large holes um, that are allowing very large amounts of material to uh, diffuse into the bloodstream and diffuse out of the bloodstream. Capillaries exist in capillary beds. It's a network of capillaries. And so if you look at this diagram down here, these little spaces here, let's get a different color so it stands out. Uh, these are the capillary beds. And so there's a lot of them. And these, here's our small arteries. We've got arterioles. We've got even smaller arterioles that sort of eventually split and split and split until we get to the capillaries. Um, there are structures known as pre-capillary sphincters that control the flow of blood into the capillaries. This is where, um, so if we need to increase the amount of blood flow, these sphincters will actually open up, allowing more blood to flow into the capillaries. That's where your flushed skin look comes from. And then if we need to restrict blood flow to those surfaces, then those will actually constrict. Um, you can have more than one artery supplying blood to a capillary bed. This is known as arterial anastomosis. Direct connections between arteries and venules, which we'll talk about in just a second. Uh, so basically that would be a, uh, some sort of linkage from this artery to this artery right here. That is known as arteriovenous anastomoses. That allows capillary beds to be bypassed um, if we're trying to get blood flow back and forth very, very quickly. Now they can also cause some problems because of the pressure differential between arteries and veins, and we'll talk about that here in just a little bit. Uh, the formation of capillary beds and new blood vessels is known as angiogenesis, and this is directed under a hormone that is uh, helpfully known as VEGF, or the vascular endothelial growth factor. So if you need to grow new blood vessels, new capillaries, and stuff like that, that's that process. All right, so we have gone through the capillary beds. We have dumped our loads, which we'll talk about how that works here in just a second. Now we're moving back to the heart by way of the veins. Uh, that's an example of one right there. These carry two blood to the heart. Usually it's deoxygenated, except for the pulmonary veins that carry oxygenated blood back to the heart. Uh, when we're classifying them, venules are the smallest veins. Medium-sized veins are uh, kind of uh, they're compared to muscular arteries as far as size. They have the thickest tunica uh, externa layer. Larger veins, including the superior and the inferior vena cavae and their larger branches, those feed directly to the heart. Superior vena cavae drains the, basically the top from your shoulders up. The inferior vena cava drains from the heart down. Okay, so the blood pressure in medium and large veins is so low, and we'll explain why in a little bit, that as the, especially in the lower um, vessels like the ones in your legs, that the gravity will actually pull the blood back down. So your veins have a special structure that arteries don't have, which are, um, Valves and these valves are actually uh, opened and closed in part by movement of your muscles, like those uh, um, 
lower arteries in your legs. As you flex the muscles in your legs, those alternate opening and closing different valves uh, to allow blood to basically sort of stepwise its way up. Um, if you're familiar with how the Panama Canal works, it's a very similar situation. Uh, a, a unit that we are interested in with veins is venous return. That's how much blood per unit of time, like per second or minute, that of blood returning back to the heart. Um, if that number is very low compared to the cardiac, excuse me, output, then there's some sort of uh, problem taking place. Not all of the blood flow is coming back to the heart. All right, so talking about blood pressure, and flow. So pressure is how fast the blood is pushed out. The flow is like the a unit of volume sort of thing. And so flow is directly proportional to pressure. The harder you push the blood, the faster it goes out. And it's inversely proportional to the re resistance. So the more resistance you have, the less flow there is and vice versa. So basically it looks like this. You could actually calculate flow rate by changes in pressure divided by the resistance. The blood pressure, um, arterial pressure is, is around 120 uh, millimeters of mercury. That's just a, a pressure um, measurement. So that's usually the top number that you're measuring as far as blood pressure is concerned. Uh, capillary hydrostatic pressure, which is the blood pressure in the capillaries, ranges from 18 to 35 millimeters of mercury. And then venous pressure is very low at 18 millimeters of mercury. And so there's this very, there's a progressive decreasing in the amount of pressure, which means there's gonna decrease in the amount of flow. And uh, this is largely gonna be because of, and this is gonna be changes in the resistance. Now you can also, one of the things like if you're increasing blood pressure, most of the time um, increases in blood pressure I think I say this, I'm gonna go ahead and say it now just in case. Increases in blood pressure are characterized by constriction of the arteries, not changes in how hard the heart is beating. And so that's what's going on in this picture right here. Um, as we constrict the blood vessel from here to here, uh, pressure, is going, pressure is going to increase. And so that's going to increase the flow rate. Hopefully I'll be talking about that a little bit later, but if not, there you go. Okay, so uh, for circulation to occur, in order for heart to leave your heart, blood to leave your heart and then come back, circulatory pressure must overcome uh, total peripheral resistance, which is vascular resistance, blood viscosity, how thick it is, and turbulence, whatever things are sort of blocking that flow, causing eddies and stuff like that. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why you're vessels with very high blood pressure have very thick elastic walls to resist those uh, pulsing pressure changes. Vascular resistance is the largest component, um, primarily friction, which is determined by the vessel length. The longer the vessel, the greater the friction, and the vessel diameter. Um, the larger or smaller the blood vessel, the um, greater the changes in blood pressure. Blood viscosity is how thick it is. The thicker your blood is, so like if you're dehydrated, the greater the resistance. Um, turbulence is eddies or swirls in blood flow if there's like blockages and stuff like that. Um, and so basically your heart has to co overcome this total peripheral resistance in order for your blood to circulate. Talking about arterial blood pressure, this is what we're measuring when you're taking your blood pressure. Um, this is the old school way and some people, some folks still do that. Other times they'll get the automatic one either on your arm or your wrist um, and then read it that way. Systolic pressure is the peak blood pressure during ventricular systole. Uh, diastolic is the minimum blood pressure at the end of ventricular diastole. So during the height of the contraction phase of the ventricle and the height of the relaxation phase, of the ventricle, that's where we get those numbers. So like 110 over 70 or, you know, whatever. The mean arterial pressure is known as MAP, <clears throat> which is the diastolic pressure plus pulse pressure divided by three. Okay, and so this, now I do wanna point out that 
this um, this chart, actually I just realized before I started recording this, it's a little outdated. Some of these numbers have changed. Um, actually, you know, it's, it's really not that bad because normal, the key part is less than 120 uh, and less than 80, so like 110 over 70, for example. And then you've got elevated hypertension stage one, stage two, uh, hypertensive crisis is like, why are you, how are you still standing? Um, you know, and so then if you've had people in your family who have talked about hypertension and stuff like that, this is what we're talking about, elevated, uh, increasingly elevated blood pressures. And that can cause a lot of problems. Your heart is working too hard. It can become overtired. Um, you have risks of things like aneurysms and things like that. All right, so capillary exchange is, uh, we've got diffusion occurring across a concentration gradient, just simple diffusion like we've talked about. We're talking about uh, water, ions, and organic molecules. The, those move, so like um, dehydration, if there's more water in the blood than the tissue fluids, the water's gonna diffuse out. Uh, there's also going to be filtration, removal of solutes across a porous membrane, so you can like send water across, but then other solutes stay or that sort of thing. That happens a lot like in the kidneys. Um, that's because they're too large to pass through the pores in the membrane. And then you got re reabsorption, which is a uh, reuptake of water. So water comes back into um, the capillaries through osmosis. The greater the solutions of solute, the greater the osmotic pressure. And so that basically means the water is going to flow more quickly. Think of um, having a little bit of corn, uh, a little bit of corn syrup in water where we put the eggs in way back in the day, versus if it was pure corn syrup, you could in the pure corn syrup you could see the water leaving very easily um, because the solute concentration, so the osmotic pressure is greater. Here's some of the stuff that we're uh, talking about basically, and so if you look um, filtration, we have things leaving. Uh, we have water leaving the cell because the arterial pressure is greater in the capillary on the artery side right here. And so water is going to be forced out. Mid capillary, we have no, there's no net movement. So the same amount of water coming in is going out. So the pressure, the hydrostatic pressure is the same between um, the within the capillary and without. And then that pressure continues to drop. So we have a net pressure inside that's less than what's on the outside. So we have reabsorption. We have that water coming back in to um, the capillaries from the interstitial fluids. Um, <clears throat> this is some of the things that are actually being pushed out we have oxygen and nutrients being carried out. And we're gonna talk about in greater detail how that works. It's a partial pressure thing um, as far as how hemoglobin gets off of the uh, red blood cells and stuff like that. And then we have carbon dioxide and waste coming back in because of um, concentration differences. Uh, at this end right here, we've got less oxygen outside than we do inside, so the oxygen's gonna leave. Um, and then here we've got uh, the carbon dioxide is going to do the same thing. We've got more carbon dioxide here than we do here, so the carbon dioxide comes in. All right, so uh, blood flow and pressure is auto-regulated. Um, uh, you have immediate changes using those precapillary sphincters. That's auto-regulation, so the blood vessels are regulating themselves. Uh, other controls are neuromechanisms. So these are changes with, that are triggered by the autonomic nervous system um, that are responding to uh, pressure changes, fluid volume changes, blood gas levels. Um, you've got receptors in your brain that actually measure the acidity of your blood, which is a, a way to measure carbon dioxide levels. Um, and so you'll have short-term adjustments here, primarily regulated by the medulla oblongata. A lot of these are unconscious changes. Um, 
increasing respiration rate because you're not getting enough oxygen, because carbon dioxide levels are too high, that sort of thing. Uh, endocrine mechanisms, so like this, we uh, the blood volume feedback loop that we had people present in class before we left for um, December break. Um, we've got short-term adjustments, but then we've also got overall long-term changes in cardiovascular performance. So it's sort of stepwise. Autoregulation is very quick, very local. Neuromechanical is uh, a little bit longer term, automatic, um, and then endocrine systems can have longer lasting cardiovascular changes. The circulation route, we've got two different circuits and I've mentioned them before. We've got the pulmonary cell circuit that goes um, from the right side of the heart to the lungs where oxygen is picked up and carbon dioxide is offloaded. We've got the systemic circuit, which is every place else that isn't your lungs from the left side of the heart, where we distribute blood and primarily oxygen and nutrients to the tissues and then picking up carbon dioxide in other ways and bringing them back to the heart so they can be sent to the pulmonary circuit. So we've got these two circuits that are operating and they operate at the exact same time. We looked at that when we did the cardiac cycle notes. This is our uh, breakdown of the major arteries that we're gonna need to know, and a lot of these are listed in the study guide. The biggest thing that you're gonna need to know is the route that blood takes. So like as the blood leaves the heart, right here it goes to the aorta where it comes down. Um, the descending aorta, for example, um, and then from there, like if you're going to the kidneys, it goes to the hepatic artery right there. Um, if you're coming down from there, like if you're feeding the sort of abdominal area, you've got the iliac arteries right there. Um, we've got uh, the branches of the, the arteries right here. We've got carotid, I'm sorry, carotid's up here. Um, subclavian artery, which feeds the arms that goes to the maxilla, axillary artery and brachial arteries, and it's branches into ulnar and radial arteries and stuff like that. So the biggest thing you'll want, need to be able to do essentially is trace your way through from the heart through these different branches of the, um, uh, the different arteries. So study through, so you can use this diagram if you'd like um, to trace your way through that. And then you go backwards and you start with the veins. And so a lot of these now, it makes it easier. Um, a lot of them, you just have to memorize one. So like you've got an axillary vein, you've got a brachial vein, there's a renal vein, um, a hepatic portal vein. Now I, I want, I need to make a correction because I literally just said that the hepatic arteries go to the kidneys and that's wrong. The hepatic arteries go to the liver. The renal arteries go to the kidneys. Hepatic is liver, renal is um, kidneys. So a lot of the same names, you've got iliac veins and iliac arteries. Uh, there's a few differences like jugular versus carotid, but uh, there's a lot of overlap so it makes things easier. If something's gonna go down the mesenteric artery, it's gonna come back by the mesenteric vein. Um, so one of the things you'll need to do is be able to trace blood, like a red blood cell from the heart to your hand and then back. Okay, that, like that's an example scenario. Um, so what are, the, what, what are the chambers that it goes through? What are the blood arteries that the red blood cell goes through? Then the capillary beds, then what veins are gonna take it back to which parts of the heart? Uh, we, uh, and we'll practice some of this stuff when we come back in class after, if you, after you've had a chance to take your notes. Um, if you have any questions over any of this stuff, let me know, send me an email, send me a remind message, ask me in class. Otherwise, um, this wraps up the circulatory system. We'll do respiratory system here in a little while. Um, talk about some more gas exchange stuff. So I guess uh, that's it. I look forward to seeing y'all again soon.